So welcome to the second weekend of the Spring Rights Literary Festival. I am Robin Schwartz. I'm the program and grant director of the Community Arts Partnership of Tompkins County. Spring Rights is just one of our many events. We have the Greater Ithaca Art Trail. We have the Cap Art Space. I, I administer many grants for artists and arts organizations. And we have uh, the Spring Rights Literary Festival. Uh, there are two more nights of the festival and um, workshops December through March. I'm repeating myself because there's more people coming in from the waiting room. And I'm going to put our Community Arts Partnership website up in the chat so you could check out everything that we do and join our mailing list. Um, I want to put in a plug for the Capapalooza Art Sale, which starts next Friday in the Cap Art Space Gallery. They're going to be, I mean, I today was the first donation day. People are dropping off donations of used art. I'm not asking artists to donate their original work. We're getting stuff that's in your closets and your basements. And uh, I got 150 pieces today in three hours. So this is going to be a big sale. I priced the work really low because I want it all sold out in three days. It's a major fundraiser for the Community Arts Partnership. We've made as much as $8,000. It's over the course of 17 hours. It starts on Friday, goes through Sunday. So uh, as far as social distancing goes, there's not gonna be that many people in the gallery at a time. And it's huge space. It's like a 50 foot by a 20 foot space. Um, and again, on our website, artspartner.org. We also have a first Saturday event where artists on the art trail are open on Saturday the 5th, also on our website. I need to thank our wonderful Spring Rights sponsors, Ithaca College, Wegmans, m and Bank, the Odyssey Bookstore, and the Ithaca Marriott. We also have funds from the New York State Council on the Arts and Poets and Writers. We would love it if you were able to donate to the Community Arts Partnership. And, you know, I didn't want to do a suggested donation for the Spring Rights because I knew that would have limited the audience, but of course we need donations. So if you are able, please do. I'm going to put that link up. Any amount is awesome. You will all be on mute throughout the events. For the artists who are on this call, to Roger and Jamie and Saviana and Brian and Marina and Peter, I'm going to make you co-hosts, or Leah, you can make them co-hosts. And that means you will be able to take yourself off mute. Everyone else will be on mute and everyone should definitely use the chat Let's talk to each other through chat. Let's comment on what we're seeing. You have any questions for the artists, any questions for me? Uh, say hi to each other, do that all through chat. So without further ado, I'm going to turn this program over to Roger Hecht. I first of all want to thank you, Robin, for including me uh, in this amazing festival. Uh, I've run a few myself, so I know how to sense of what goes on behind the scenes and uh, this has just been such a marvelous affair uh, and your transition to this new as they say in academia this new modality uh, mm -hmm. is uh, seems pretty seamless to me so so I and and I'm very happy to be included with this wonderful group of writers um, I'm gonna read a few poems I know we only have uh, 10 minutes or so uh, from my new collection witness report, which seems to be coming out backwards, but uh, I don't, uh, on my screen anyhow, I don't know how it looks on your screen. I saw it um, normal. Just a few poems to give you a sample of some of the things I'm interested in. Um, this first poem, uh, which I marked and can't find now, uh, is called uh, The Ornery Orrery. Um, I don't know, an orrery for some of you who don't know, it's that sort of 18th century model of the mechanical model of the, of the solar system um, uh, that was very popular back then. The ornery orrery. Egad, cried Machiavelli, this orrery is stuck. The planets won't align. Now how will I predict the rise and fall of kings, the comings and goings of plagues? and on which horse God wills me to place my ducats. Leonardo, with an eye toward the mechanical, squinted at the marvelous machine, its wheels in gorgeously engraved discs, its metal spheres perched on sticks. He tried its brass gears, tightened and loosened screws, worried the crank. 
he recognized the problem at once. Fool, he cried, popping the flat-topped cap off the Florentine's head. Don't you see? This machine can't even exist. We live in a geocentric universe. This heliocentric universe won't be confirmed for 150 years. He relabeled the celestial objects and the truth came perfectly clear. Besides, your dripping candle jammed it here. He flicked a plug of wax off with his knife, turned the crank and set the future into motion. The wheels turned freely. Planets spun on er in their orbits. E eclipses came and went. Fruits tumbled from their branches. Princes became obsolete while the sun stayed firmly in place. I see, the master statesman murmured, astounded as his world fell to ruin before his eyes like clockwork. Uh, let's see, I've got another, that was a prose poem. I kind of like playing with that form a bit. This is another prose poem, ironically titled Prose Poem. I am the bones of the boy buried in the cellar, the boy the cellar was built for, the boy that was here long before there were cellars. I am the bones of the boy, but I am not the boy. I am the bones of the boy in a congress of bones, a body of boys long gone, a body that meets where there is nothing to say and no way to say it and cannot sleep. The bones of the mice, the bones of the cats dragged in, scramble the rafters to invisible nests. Their sinews dissolved, they motion back to dust where they sleep and reassemble and scramble, a different mouse each night. I never sleep, being bones still clinging to their boyhood. The boys call their meetings to order, slap secret handshakes, throw hand signs and fingers into far corners. Each meeting, each presiding officer resigns until the body finally dissolves. Again and again the motion dies. Then the boys and the bones will no longer be present to say here. Let's say the boys lit out for the frontier where there is no grass to trip them up, no roots to tangle their feet the way they entangled me. Roots worm into the cellar, root, worms root our desire. The boys who once hooked them for fish bait are now meals in the fields where circling birds remind them of universal forms stacked like Legos, logos the law they could never avoid. The boys unhinge their jaws as if they could be heard. They have no use for words now, no use for limbs, no use for the hands that held them down. Keeping an eye on time here. This is a poem in a slightly lighter vein, I hope. It's called The Blue Mug. Um, we once had a couple of very large mugs that we purchased at Ikea uh, that, let's just say, didn't work out. That big blue mug with the boat outsides, pregnant with warmth, filling your palm while fingers and, and the knuckles gripping the ceramic loop produce the illusion you can handle anything. It's no good, or not as good as it seemed at the store. It seemed generous. It gives too much. Too much hot drink, too much soup, more than you can manage. It places demands you can never meet, that you finish what you start at the pace it sets, the rate it dissipates heat. So by the time you find the perfect sip, the coffee's cold and the mug's only just half empty. Reheating in the microwave is not an inconvenience, it's a sad admission. To be disappointed in the mug is displaced. The mug knew, knows better. The disappointment is you. I'll leave that for the critics to psychoanalyze. Um, just a couple more short poems and then I'll 
we can move on. This is called, I had kind of, I don't know, it may be my age, sort of an interest in, in the physics and biology of mortality um, and what that means. This is called like scissors. Like scissors, they snip the chemical threads that hold a living being together. Bacteria, fungus, the primordial swarm. Then we're gas. Then we become element, phosphorus, carbon, something a live plant can claim. Dead, we're soup, we're cheese, we're the meal we're invited to but can never enjoy. Enjoyed, if a mold knows joy, let's say sated on, fetid because we're feast, the last supper we'll never know because by then we're already being resurrected back into the body of the world. I like to think that is a hopeful poem. Um, this is kind of in a similar vein, I think, uh, Sky Burial. Um, sky Burial is, a, is the funerary practice in Tibet, among other places, where basically the ground is granite, so there's no place to, to dig graves, so instead, cadavers, the dead are taught, brought to a, a special spot on the mountain where essentially they're left for the vultures, which I think is actually a really kind of cool idea. Sky burial. If only I could see and smell, could keep my senses as I lose them, wouldn't I find that delicious? The enzymes without me, replacing the enzymes within me, replacing cell by cell my body. Such transcendence. Patiently, they're waiting the day my defenses diminish, waiting to transfigure. And while I diminish, I will swell like pride with gases, anticipating my higher function protein for the cleansing birds, a nest, my hair, my brain case, shelter for a mouse. If I were any other animal, my skin might become shoes, my bones, knives, or needles, or buttons, or combs. It is fitting. Nothing about me wasted, nothing about me not becoming something else. Thank you very much for allowing me to share my poems with you. Thank you. So next, we're going to turn the camera. Yeah, good to be here. And thank you for organizing this. And thank you for everyone who's uh, in attendance. Um, I have a, several books that are available locally. and. Uh, my most recent poetry book is this one. It's called uh, Entering the Mountain. Uh, these books are available either at Buffalo Street Books or Odyssey Bookstore. This is Late Morning New and Selected Poems. And this is my recently published uh, novel, uh, Carnivale, uh, also available uh, at uh, Buffalo Street Books or else at Odyssey Bookstore. And uh, you can also find links to purchasing those books online if you go to my website, uh, peterfortunato.net. It's pretty easy to remember that. It's peterfortunato.net. You can learn more about me and you can find out um, about how to get the books. There's links there. And I'm not going to read any of the poems from the books. I'm going to read new poems. So here we go. Uh, I just turned 70 yesterday on November 26th, and this is a poem I was working on for a while. This is called At 70, A Song of Experience, and if you know William Blake's work, uh, you'll certainly pick up the allusion to William Blake. At 70, A Song of Experience. I was born an iron tiger. Two days past full moon and after a storm that blew out power from Chicago to New York. As astrologers foretold, my 60s were a trial, 
not exactly spears thrown down by stars, but my instinct for survival was essential to get through. My mother was afraid she'd have to birth me in the hurricane. I came out all right. But ever since, sudden changes in the weather bring these tendencies to light. I'm fiercely fine, yet terrors often visit me at night. Maybe I anticipate bad weather, as my mother did, with too much dread. Once I get a whiff of ozone in the air, I know there's lightning somewhere near. Soon comes thunder, wind, and pelting rain. Flooding rivers wash out roads, trees go down. Lucky if a twister doesn't come around. I remember when the whales were being slaughtered and arms massed so madly that we asked each other, who will save the humans? In 2020, this sounds quaint, downcast for so many reasons are so many in the days when imitation leaders speak with leather tongues. Unmasked, they're impotent, but wounded, capable of awful stuff. Think our race can't go extinct? What's that fearful fire in the forest of the night? Like a tiger burning, burning bright. Uh, Blake has always been a big influence on me and very close to my heart, as has uh, Walt Whitman. This is a poem entitled Perfume. Oh, Walt Whitman, how mammalian you are. Your armpits aroma, a scent finer than prayer. I too am hairy and roam shirtless whenever I can. I too pause near the crook in the road to peer at the industrious persons who pass by. Yet how am I to regard my exudations when I'm warned over and again, my body's odor ought never to offend. Oh, Walt, you sweaty angel. I believe honesty is still the best incense, but if I'm unwashed these days, I might be judged unsavory, maybe foreign, which isn't a crime in this country, not yet, I don't think. And worst of all, I might be thought poor. At least I don't stink of sanctimony. Furious with the pre preachers and legislators who preen and prevaricate, whose grand eloquence reeks of imposture, even from the printed page, I sweat invectives. I tremble and emanate oaths. Oh, I must cease to fulminate, sweet Walt. For the news is old already when it's published, and rather than proffering hope, soils our souls. I turn the pages of my magazine listlessly, snorting at the ploys of the publicists, their semi-nude models in chemical color. I inhale from one leaf the perfume called Eros, and from another the scent of samsara whose name means to wander in circles. And I savor such knowledge, a whiff of truth. Let us not deceive ourselves, dear Walt. A great destiny still awaits our nation, but a Stygian scouring first. The smell of manure does not daunt me. And like you, I think I could turn and live with animals. They do not sweat about their condition or lie awake in the dark and weep for their sins. They do not lie at all. Well, a lot of people have written poems uh, during the COVID crisis and during the pandemic uh, quarantines. And certainly uh, all of us have uh, searched online 
I think some of us have heard the term uh, doom scrolling, uh, just to see how bad things might get, but also searching for, you know, what is really the real information and to whom do we turn uh, for the real information? So uh, I too, uh, and this is a poem called uh, Corona Crisis Search Results. This morning at my screen, I scroll in hopes of finding news that our pandemic will conclude. News of another vaccine or treatment, or perhaps the genome of the virus has a fatal flaw. And as with a bug in a computer system, something in us can be patched against infection. There's nothing I can do about the fools who mask themselves from common sense in God's name or in defiance of community. Do politicians count as vectors of the virus? I'm not alone in searching facts about the plague that helped to end the Middle Ages. Did survivors think the victims had no choice but follow death? Images of la danse macabre portray a grinning skeleton with whom the living link their hands. Often they look gay. Death's an echo of the newborn's cry. Do toddlers sense they're in a roundelay? Some doctors tout a thing that I have always done, dancing with abandon to the music that I love. I recommend it. Good for the immune system. Um, a lot of great poets have come through Ithaca over the years. And uh, years ago, I was very active uh, with a local organization called Ithaca Community Poets. Uh, and at that time, uh, throughout the late 70s and 80s and into the early 90s, we uh, had funding from the New York State Council on the Arts praise to the New York State Council on the Arts for recognizing uh, the value of um, subsidizing poetry readings. And uh, for very modest fees, uh, many wonderful poets visited Ithaca. We had a local reading series and we also would have a visiting writers series. Uh, here's a poem about one of them who has since passed away. This is titled November, Remembering Mary Oliver. You were about to become known as that rarest of birds, a poet whose words Americans remember. Celebrity, I think, was not an award you relished. You who were happiest in silence on Cape Cod or with your dogs, attentive. At my home, after your reading in Ithaca, we stayed up talking, drinking wine, smoked cigarettes until bedtime. Next morning, black coffee, my wife off to work, but before you left, I asked if you would like to hike Six Mile Creek with me. Almost 40 years ago, and the other day, amidst the warmest, sunniest stretch I can recall since that day when we tramped nearly wordless through fallen leaves, so dry and light they seemed as if they might remember how to fly, I thought of you just as I spied a piece of slate, like a little moon, palm-sized, round, embossed with a crescent, accenting its face. There's more etched on that talisman. Your smile on that day when through the hemlock boughs and leafless beech tree branches, calling unmistakably swooping overhead, a pileated woodpecker appeared. The first you'd ever seen. Happy I could bring you this, I said, yes. They live here too. And I'll finish up uh, with this poem, a very recent poem also. All of these poems are fairly recent. Uh, 
This is a poem entitled Gratitude to Autumn. Here's the witch holding her leaves who will flower midwinter with weird yellow frills, hazel whose scent is a gift. And I'm keeping faith with fungi unseen, transforming rot into magical fruit. Thank you also, spirits of air, riffling my hair, and waters nearby who carry away human cares. Please dissolve my dark moods if walking these woods I despair. Thank you very much. Good to be here with you. Thank you, Peter. That was great. Um, the next writer is Jamie Warburton. Let me know if I oh. pronounced your name. Did I say your last name correctly? It was completely sufficient. Oh, good. Yeah. <laughs> this is all we care about. Thanks, Rob. <laughs> um, I'm a little bit sad that I didn't get to go directly after Roger said, the disappointment is you. I thought that would be a great introduction for me. Um, but sadly, I'll just go now. Um, hi, I am always so interested in some of the things that are also thematically related tonight, which are, can you hear the fireworks? My neighborhood sets off fireworks a lot. I hear them. Yeah, anyway, yeah. yeah, I know it's remarkable. Um, but I love talking about death, having a good time, defining words. Uh, gonna read you, looks like I think seven poems. The first one is called, We're of an Age Now. We're of an age now when my friends and I send each other pictures of our surgical scars. This one looks like a bite, I type, and whoosh, off goes the lumpectomy site. Clematis scar raised and all that fat round ripeness scooped out. My breast is depressed. We are utterly without eroticism. We are less romantic than bathroom designers. My friends eye the side of my breast. Yep, right there, they say, like prospectors jabbing at an X marked mine. Excise, noun, a tax levied on certain goods or the licenses for pleasures. What pleasures this body has bought me, I admit. It was about time I paid what was due. T sends me a picture of a lump cut from her arm. It rests in a small clear cup. What a hue. It looks like a piece of peach, she writes. It's true. What a beautiful fruit is the misbehaving body of my friend, my fleshly friend. I would swallow her. I would be the cup. I would be her ashtray as she taps and laughs. My body, the bodies of my friends. Were we growing on trees? Would we pluck each other? Will we have grown all along? Will we drop to the ground with our compatriots, wasps buzzing nearby? T sends me the sunset of her bruising. We watch it glow together. We nod and clink glasses. We watch ourselves fall, become pits, become trees. Next is called case and switch statements. I want to think less about myself, but the problem with that is I want. My sin is unoriginal, but she does have a car and my sex, my dress, my relative pitch. As for the body, that most metonymous, what am I but a figure of speech? Why did God make the word? To make little girls like you. Why did God make the world? to make little girls like you ask questions. A catechism. Who among us can say, I am bleeding and not this body is bleeding? Who among us can say, stone me? Who among us can say mortification and mean it? Who can say, celebrate this flesh because it's done all right by me and I yearn for yours and what miracle of deeper grammar is that? Miracle a word rather popular in 1870 and not so much in the year of my birth. I, instead try, 
I am taking off my clothes. Try closing my eyes. Try touching your arm with your eyes closed. Try why you can't feel your kidney, your pancreas, unless it's destroying itself. Try please touch me, scratch that. Try touch my, scratch that. Try the word tortoise. Try imagining the way a tortoise feels when you stroke its carapace. Wonder why we wonder if a tortoise can feel your finger. Try wondering why we see soft and think self, see hard and think nail. Sometimes I think of my life, I didn't want this, but I'll be damned if I'll quit it. Now, isn't that desire a muck? A muck a culture bound syndrome. Here's how to do it. Brood for a while, then kill everyone around you until you collapse. <laughs> how like desire, how like me. No, kidding, I'm not a killer. Or I'm sure I could be given the right circumstances, which is what I say to all of you too, which is why we might do well to be careful of circumstances above all else. Circumstance, it's a fact. Self, it's a perception. I stand around myself to become a condition. At least comedic timing improves with age. By the day I die, I'll have become a real joke. One of the things that um, you'll notice kind of cropping up in this particular selection of definitions of words, um, the word miracle shows up a few times. I went to Catholic school. This poem is called The Same Sad As Me. I'll finish the wine in your glass, lick the maple crusted pan. Just tell me what you wore at your wedding. Prance with me like meerkats. Isn't the sky a confusing feeling tonight, half storm and half something else? What do you feel like under it? I feel like, I feel like. This is my favorite cheese. This is my favorite cat. This is my favorite pair of socks. Did you play that game with your mother when she hides behind your bed until you swear you're home alone? Then she jumps out and yells, I'm not your mother. In the toy store, can you find the glowing sheep, the spinning bats, the geodes dusty and uncracked, the jaguar crouch, jaguar pounce, flip books half under discount cards? the silks. When your husband comes home, does he find you at your desk, all cigarettes and crumpled starts? Do you look up? Do you say, let's watch the Three Stooges. I need to see a banana peel and a two by four before bed. Somebody's unmuted and typing. Robin, is it you? Oh, hell. <laughs> Of course it wasn't you. me. I would never do that. No, I think it, it would have been you. I hope it, I hope it's, I hope it's going Was well. I unmuted when I said, oh, hell? Yes. <laughs> oh. <laughs> it was very on theme. Thank you. Yes, I was, I was, I'm typing poetry. All right, keep, go, keep going. <laughs> okay, this next one is called Intercession. In my romance of self-pity, I make a list of ways to leave you. Number one, the way fog leaves a hilltop after the sun. Number two, burn down my house. Three, there's no three because I lack creativity and ambition, both. I've got my mother's streak of martyrdom tempting my body into an oil painting pose, all be arrowed and eye rolled. I'd imagined I'd be more useful once. But is use what I want from you or from life itself? I want jailing. I want a breakout. I guess I want you on some cosmic witness stand. A nightmare for you, I'm sure. Yes, yes, I admit it. I loved her all along. Look, I know the order of things. It's only a matter of time of nerve endings and scutes, my impatience with myself and the love that dare not speak its, oh, fuck this, speak me. I'm not living in your Russian novel. Open your eyes. There was no mountain, now there is. You're welcome. 
Hurry up. This next piece is a pantoum for those of you who are at a poetry reading because you have read a lot of poetry, you'll recognize that as a, a form in which there's a, a repetition in various pattern of, of the same line. So every line in the pantoum basically appears twice. Um, I wrote this, my old friend Shaul decided that we should do some formal exercises for fun and he's been picking some forms and we're writing the poems and this is one of them. This is a pantoum called The Rest is Truth. If you live long enough, everything changes. Around you, there's a truth that isn't. Why bother pinning it? Look, the squirrel runs up a post, not into the street. The written word is a chloroformed butterfly. What cruelty. There's a truth that isn't. Why? Bother pinning it together, you'll find another seam, the written word. Is a chloroformed butterfly what cruelty looks like? There's only so much joke in every joke. Together, you'll find another. Seam, a verb to weigh down. Is that what my face looks like? There's only so much joke in every joke. A shrimp's heart is in its head and I'm the same. A verb to weigh down. Is that what my face? Look, the squirrel runs up a post, not into the street. A shrimp's heart is in its head and I'm the same. If you live long enough, everything changes around you. Two more to go. Uh, this is called Leaving the Funeral of My Ex-Lover's Mother. I watch from the back. When we leave a family, we lose our rights to mourn. When we mourn anyway, we are welcomed by secrets. Surprise October blizzards. A dynamite pass, white, no sight and no sound, but pushing silence. Strangers pushing out our cars. I'd say we make another family of the briefest shade. This is family, trying to keep each other alive, knowing that eventually we all fail and are failed, our mourning brooches buried and back pews emptied. We make finger bone after finger bone burnt. Bedsteads, rose bushes, painted wooden deer, board church walls, knotted rope bell pull. We make these things by hand. The Irish wool sweater that replaced Margot's body folded on the coffin lid. A black fight settles in her daughter's seaweed hair. We never could do more but sing. All right, I have one more for you. I wanna say thank you, of course, for this fantastic opportunity. I love that Spring Rights went right into fall and into the internet and into every other place that we absolutely needed it to be. Thank you, Robin, for organizing this and to my fellow readers tonight. And thanks to all for being here. Uh, I hope you're getting to do something really fun like empty the dishwasher too while you're listening. This is called, I Tell You a Bedtime Story. There comes the day when the miracle fails when it's too hard to tell wolf from girl, no matter how you check size of eyes, of thighs. There comes the day when the lunar tick tops past some pebble in the sky and you never see it. When you say, wait, am I the train or am I on the tracks? When the damp kneed fawn stands arrowed, orphaning, her parents, when the slow dressing down of flesh leaves you melted and railing, when from now on our parents die all the time. Friends, where is your pitchfork parade? Barter rams for butter and best this brain pan, greased this heart that snuffles bull blind. Come with your reminders, bring your volleys of herbs. Tell me about being alive. 
Tell me, please, the story of the sizzle, the hiss, the breath we breathe just before we kiss. Tell me you'll keep watch when my eyes are closing. Tell me we'll die still alive, still inhaling. Thanks so much. Thank you, Jamie. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Yes, good. I, this is just a weird thing to say, but for some reason I get the words mute and unmuted mixed up. There's no reason for that to happen. Um, it's embarrassing. Uh, I've gotten other words mixed up in my life, but it's a problem when I do Zoom so much. <laughs> so the next person we're going to highlight is Brian Arnold. Okay, um, thanks Robin. I'll Hi, do my Brian. best to follow up uh, Jamie's wit and, and camera presence. Um, and I'm actually going to do a screen share and uh, change the direction of our conversation a little bit. Um, as a quick uh, bit of background, uh, I'm a photographer much more than I am a writer. And as my day job, um, I work as an Indonesian language translator at Cornell. And um, after a little bit of back and forth with Robin uh, over the past week, I've decided uh, not to read uh, from the book that I'm finishing, but mostly just to walk you through it and share a little bit about what I've been working on. Uh, I've been working on a book the last five years, uh, which all said and done, or when the day's done, uh, will be out uh, early next year. Uh, and it is an anthology of essays called A History of Photography in Indonesia. Um, for this project, I have been working as both a writer, or more than both, I've been working as a writer, translator, and editor. Um, the finished book is going to be uh, 18 chapters. Um, I am writing six of them and translated three of them and commissioned uh, writers from around the world uh, to contribute. Um, quickly to say a little bit about Indonesia and my interest in Indonesia. Um, a friend of mine at the New York, at the consulate, Indonesian consulate in New York City, uh, I think accurately describes Indonesia as the largest country in the world nobody knows anything about. And I have been traveling to, and, to Indonesia and studying Indonesian music and art since the early 1990s. And I have been working on a series of photographic projects since 2011. Uh, almost four years ago to date, as some of you might recall, um, I organized an exhibition at the Johnson Museum uh, called Identity Crisis, Reflections on Public and Private Life in Contemporary Javanese Photography, uh, an exhibition of work by 10 photographers from Indonesia, from Java, um, that was at, on a, uh, up at the museum between January and May. And to the best of my knowledge, it was the first exhibition held in the United States that was devoted to work uh, by Indonesian photographers. Uh, this book that I'm talking about today in a way predates that ex exhibition and in a way was also kind of spawned uh, from that exhibition. Uh, and since so much of the, the content of the book is visual rather than textual, or at least visual as much as textual, um, I thought I would just uh, share with you uh, some of the book and then maybe if there are questions or an opportunity uh, to do so, I can share a little bit about what it was like working with these writers and museums from around the world and putting something like this together. Uh, the cover of the book, uh, it's a black and white photograph made by a Dutch photographer in the early 20th century, about 100 years ago, that was switched to a red and white monochrome. Um, red and white are the colors of the Indonesian flag. Um, as I mentioned, um, my interest and in history with Indonesia goes back to 1992. Um, when I ventured there as a college study abroad student, I went to study Balinese gamelan and Balinese religion. Uh, I imagine some of you have probably gone to Bali. Uh, it is a remarkably unique corner of the world, smaller than Rhode Island, and it has a language and religion entirely unique to the island. And you will find more artists per capita in Bali than anywhere else. So the introduction to the book uh, is largely about some of those first experiences I had in Indonesia and how they 
have really uh, proven to be enough um, to launch a lifelong study. And the two pictures you're seeing here are some of the first photographs I ever made uh, and pictures that I made uh, that first time in Bali. Um, part of the reason I chose not to read and more just to talk a little bit about how this book is put together and what some of the content is, is that it is for a specialized audience of people who are interested in photography, art history, uh, and or Indonesian art history, Indonesian culture. And I think given how ubiquitous photography is in our culture today, we forget that it's still relatively new, invented in 1839, um, and also remarkably complicated in terms of how it has been used to create and subjugate culture. Um, so one of the essays that I contributed, one of the six that I contributed, um, is a look at the invention of photography. So the picture you see there in the bottom right corner is Jean-Louis Daguerre, a Frenchman whom uh, invented the medium, or at least took out the first photographic patent. Interestingly enough, a lot of the Western Euro European powers that uh, created or um, propagated photography early on were also colonizing nations uh, and photography quickly moved to their colonial endeavors. Uh, and the Dutch government, which um, occupied Indonesia for a couple hundred years really, was the first of the European powers to commission photographers um, to look at their colonial endeavors. So this is really the subject of the beginning of the book. Uh, one of the writers I worked with is a curator from the National Gallery of Canberra, and or I'm sorry, the National Gallery of Australia in Canberra, who amassed one of the largest colonial era or collections of colonial era photographs from the Dutch East Indies uh, in the world right now. Uh, this is a particular uh, spread from the book that uh, looks at some early newspaper advertisements and postcards for different uh, photographic studios. Um, in the early 20th century. Uh, another curator from Australia um, whom looks at kind of the, the legacies of uh, European pictures of power, of uh, kind of um, photographs of politicians and state leaders and how that was manifest uh, in the colonial, uh, the colonial nation. Uh, with my connection in Cornell, as some of you may or may not know, uh, Cornell is really globally renowned for their Southeast Asia program. Uh, I currently work in the Southeast Asian Library, which is one of the largest holdings of Southeast Asian studies and languages in the world. And uh, one of the architects of the Cornell Southeast Asia program uh, is really a hero of mine, a woman named Claire Holt, uh, who never finished college uh, worked for the CIA before they were the CIA uh, and um, taught art history at Cornell and put together what both in Indonesia and the United States is considered one of the best Indonesian art histories to date. Um, and her photographic archives are actually a tre tremendous influence on me uh, as well as her work in Indonesia. So I wrote a whole chapter on her, her photographic work in particular uh, one of her primary interests in Indonesia was dance. Uh, so these are photographs of dancers and implements used in dance and other types of performance uh, rituals. Um, again, like another chapter that I wrote, uh, looking at the development of uh, photographic technologies over a longer period of time and the ongoing march to the democratic medium that we know of photography today, that we know photography to be today. Um, all of that happened incrementally. And as that, uh, that development, that really um, evolution to really populist uh, tool and resource, uh, as all of that developed, um, attitudes toward the, the colonial missions um, changed with a lot of Europeans. Uh, and you started to have a whole generation right around World War II of European intelligentsia armed with like 35 millimeter cameras and inexpensive materials. You started to photograph around Asia, Latin America and Africa and started to depict um, 
these colonized nations in ways that had never really been uh, seen in Europe before. So I wrote a chapter on uh, some mid, mid 20th century European photographers whom became um, kind of a visual voice for undermining the colonial uh, governments that the Western powers had put in place. Uh, this particular image I love a great deal is by a Dutch photographer named Cass Orthus, uh, who was uh, imprisoned by the Nazis for his leftist activities, and then went over to Indonesia after World War II and put together this really remarkable manifesto um, calling for an end to the colonial occupation of the islands. Uh, a really remarkably unique moment in the history of Indonesian photography uh, happened right around World War II with the establishment of an organization called IPHOS, I-P-P-H-O-S, uh, which is a, an acronym of, for the Indonesian Press Photographic Services. And it was really the only indigenous um, photographic or photojournalist service uh, in the archipelago uh, between about 1945 and 1950. And if you know much about the, the aftermath of World War II, particularly in Southeast Asia, that was really the time that the colonies of Southeast Asia emerged as independent nations. So EFOS being really the one indigenous, indigenously run um, uh, photographic resources really made the only uh, complete uh, documentation of the march towards independence at least as we know it in Indonesia. Uh, so this is from a chapter on, on the development of this particular organization and their role in um, propagating uh, Indonesian independence. Uh, the picture you're seeing second from the top right, Merdeka, is a newspaper that they founded because they were having such a hard time disseminating their own pictures. And Merdeka means freedom, as you might be able to guess from the cover of the paper. Um, so I have been very lucky, and uh, in some ways, it's also been extremely challenging uh, to work with so many different writers from around the world, as I mentioned in putting this together. Uh, one of them is somebody who's become a very good friend of mine over the past six or seven years, uh, a Javanese art historian and curator who actually currently lives in the Netherlands. Um, but he wrote this really interesting essay uh, about the first known essay written in Bahasa Indonesia, which is the, the national language of Indonesia. So the first known essay written in the Indonesian language about photography conceived as a fine art, uh, which was written in the 1950s. Uh, and if, if any of you know a bit about the development of photography in the United States or Western Europe, that was about 100 years after we started talking about it as a fine art in, in the Western world. So it's an interesting essay that has these really great uh, historical artifacts included in it uh, from this early publication. Um, again, like one of the really great and interesting things about Indonesia, uh, in addition to being uh, the largest Muslim population in the world, they are one of the largest democracies in the world and also one of the youngest democracies in the world. Uh, Indonesia emerged as a democratic nation in 1998 uh, when a dictator who'd been in place for close to 35 years finally lost power. And uh, interestingly enough, uh, photography had a really prominent role in, uh, in facilitating this transition, facilitating a transition to a government for the people uh, rather than for the oligarchs and the aristocrats. Uh, so this is an, an essay written by an extremely interesting anthropologist who teaches at CUNY Queens in New York City named Karen Strassler, who uh, has written a lot about the role of photography and the transition to Indonesia as a democratic nation. Uh, an organization in Indonesia that I've been working with for a very long time is called the Gallery, uh, the, I'll have to say it in English rather than Indonesian, it's the uh, Photojournalistic Gallery of Antara. Uh, Antara is one of the longest running Indonesian news agencies. And for those of you who might spend time in the New York City uh, art world, 
there are more photography galleries and museums than you can count in one city. And I think that's pretty true with the United States and Western Europe. Uh, there is only one in Indonesia and they just closed their doors in 2020 as a result of the pandemic. So there is no longer a photo gallery or museum in Indonesia. Uh, but I have been working closely with this gallery the past couple of years. Uh, this is an essay that I kind of co-wrote slash translated with one of the founders of that gallery that looks at the history of the organization. Uh, this particular page spread is one of my favorite uh, photographic works made in Indonesia, uh, all made in the small southeastern island of Sumbawa, which would be pretty close to Australia and New Zealand. And it's about this phenomena of very young children uh, taught to be uh, horse jockeys because of their light weight. And it's, the pictures are remarkable and it's a really difficult and a more tragic subject than you can imagine. Uh, photography, like one part of the thesis of the exhibition I had at the Johnson Museum uh, three and a half years ago, four years ago, that I think is also really important for this new book I'm putting together. Uh, photography in the Western world has a history that overlaps with conceptual art and performance art and installation and video and film. But photography in the Western world also has a history entirely independent of those other genres or other mediums. And photography is a fine art in Indonesia is a very new thing uh, for much of the time after the colonial endeavors, uh, photography was dismissed as a tool of the colonizers and was uh, kind of resoundingly rejected um, as really kind of any populist or fine art form It's really only used for journalism. And much of the change um, really happening in the last 20 to 25 years was the development of new media technologies which I kind of suggested a moment ago uh, was really um, a key transition in making it a much more democratic medium. And the results that, the results that you've seen in Indonesia, I think, are um, a remarkably new contemporary art scene that's developing around new media, uh, specifically around photography. So this is from a chapter written by one of the kind of pioneering figures of video and digital art in Indonesia illustrated by some work by some contemporary new media artists. So Brian, I forgot to keep people to 10 minutes. Okay, so I'm we've almost already, done, yeah. We've, we're up at eight o'clock and we still have two more people. Okay, I can just so, stop now. Unless you wanna just say something as a, a closing closing statement. Uh, I'll, I'll close with this one, um, which is uh, the picture on the right I selected for this particular presentation in particular, because uh, that is the American novelist, Richard Wright. Um, uh, maybe 50 or 60 years ago, Indonesia tried to create a sort of um, NATO alliance with the post-colonial world. Uh, so they brought leaders from Africa and Asia together to try and create a new vision for a post-colonial world. And the novelist Richard Wright was um, living in Paris at the time, but he loved the idea. So he talked the CIA actually into paying for him to go to Indonesia to write a record at this event. Uh, and I actually conclude the book with a bit of a discussion on this conference that was put together by the Indonesian government and the legacy that it has on Indonesia and how we understand contemporary art and photography in the nation. And I'll leave it at that, thank you. Thank you so much, that was, that was really beautiful. Um, next up is Saviana Stanescu. Hi. Hi, Saviana. I haven't seen you in a long time. Hey, hi, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> the, hi, Robin. Thank you so much for organizing and producing this festival. Uh, thank you all for, for being here and staying with us. And I'm trying to adjust my head. <laughs> and um, um, what can I say? I'm going to start um, reading. Oh, if Jamie is right and uh, we grow funnier with age, I should be hilarious at this point, but let's see how I do it. <laughs> All right. So um, for those people who don't know me, I'm a Romanian poet and playwright who protested in the streets at the Romanian revolution against dictatorship, worked as a journalist in the free press of the 1990s, last century and has been living and working in the US since August 2001. 
I feel I've lived a few lives and started all over again a few times. So I'm grateful that I still get to tell my stories and have people like you listening to them. Thank you all for being here. Um, oh, I have over 20 books of poetry and drama published and translated in various languages. A few of the books in English are here behind me. You can also find them on my page on Amazon. I will read the first the poem from my book, Google Me that can also serve as a sort of introduction. Google me. I had to move into another language. Mine was too small, too poor, too lazy, too beautiful, but self-destructive in an old fashioned romantic way. The words grew to fight with each other and die on cyber battlefields, defeated by the god of internet and the American dream always reborn out of the ash of our daily nightmares. Google me, Google me. Everyone I know Googles me now. Google is my proof that I exist. I think therefore I am. No, I have a website, therefore I am. www.saviana.com. That's why I really needed to move into the English language. So people who Google me can understand who I am and what I'm doing on this noisy earth. I called the movers to help me, no one answered. But I must say that the voice of the machine answering my call was really sweet. She said, thank you for calling Global Movers. You need a passport, you need a visa, you need to wait in line at the American Embassy in Bucharest. You need to get up early. There are people waiting since last night, sleeping on the sidewalk across the embassy. You can't stay on the same side. There are guards guarding and you don't have an American passport. So thank you for calling and try again during our office hours, although we don't actually have off here. Hours. We are an internet company. Uh, visit our website. You can travel wherever you want on our website. We are looking forward to your feedback. Write it down on globalmoversblocks.com. Well, I couldn't hear very well what she said, but why do I need to move at all? Why do I need to travel? There's a McDonald's on my block in Bucharest. There's a cinema with Hollywood movies two blocks away. I've got a laptop, a DVD player, an American dishwasher, everything is fine. Global movers, I don't need you. I'll just stay here in my small Romanian apartment. I Google everything and everybody. I live a full life in English without subtitles and I'll never move, I'll never talk. But I will have a funny screen name like Peaches in the Sun or Hole in the flag. Now I will read an old poem from uh, my book called um, Advice for Housewives and Muses. Florina. One fine day, Florina burst into bloom. Each strand of hair on her perfect body, some say firm, others say tearingly soft, musical and fair, each and every strand metamorphosed into a petal. Yes, a petal. In the evening, Florina comes, her chrysanthemums, dahlias, but you haven't seen anything yet. You should gaze upon her hands at the fleshy, sinuous phrygias, reaching, mingling, blooming, opening wide. What fragrance when Florina dances, but you haven't seen anything yet because those long legs of hers, some say like a mother's, others say too thin and barny, like daisies tremble side by side in rows, planted in the garden beds of parks. For a long time now, Florina hasn't moved. So as not to ruin that sister garden, her Siamese twin, she stays exactly like that. Neighbors come to the courtyard, passerby, tourists arrive to see her, feel her, smell her. So her parents sell tickets just to look at Florina, how she stays so still. She has learned to wait to understand the sun and the rain, to fear hail and children, young lovers who pluck her petals and recite, she loves me, she loves me not, she loves me, she loves me not. It's so pretty to see them, the young dandies, the mature gentlemen, all the bachelors who line up to smell Florina's feet, to caress those daisies sprouted from her thighs, to water Florina's flowers with saliva, sweat, tears, to make an offering of seed somewhere, maybe some different sort of flower or something like a flower or who knows what kind of petaled witchery. 
might spring up from the warm, hard, smooth, sweet earth of Florina. For a long time, Florina hasn't moved, but old crumbs, gypsies, neighborhood gossips swear that at the very moment she gave up the ghost, water gushed from her mouth. Water kept flowing and an artesian well remains right there in the middle of a garden, Florina. Uh, as a playwright, I have always tried to give a voice to powerful, rebellious women. Starting with my first dramatic poem produced abroad at Théâtre Gérard Philippe de Saint-Denis in Paris, The Outcast. It might have something to do with my Roma roots on my father's side and challenging the stereotype of the gypsies. I keep writing stories about people who are nomads, migrants, outcasts, the marginalized, the oppressed, the discriminated against, the othered, in the hope that our multiplicity of identities and multi-rooted belonging will someday be fully celebrated as the new meaning of global. I will start with a monologue from my first play in English. I will only read two monologues, don't worry. <laughs> a monologue from my first play in English, Waxing West, a hairy tale in four seasons, uh, written as a graduate student in the MFA in Dramatic Writing Program at NYU, winner of the John Golden Award for Excellence in Playwriting and the New York Innovative Theater Award for Outstanding Play. It's the story of a Romanian cosmetologist, Daniela, who fought at the Romanian Revolution against dictator Ceausescu and now finds herself in New York in an arranged marriage, trying to figure out how to fit into this new world and relationship. Daniela, she has lots of books around her, imagine them. I've been trying, you can't say I haven't tried. I've got all these self-help books. I've written down the main ideas. Choose your tomorrow, before, perfectionist, misunderstood, love junkie, overreactive, self-effacing. After, flexible, good communicator, self-accepting, in control, assertive. I read them all. I'm dysfunctional, you're dysfunctional. It's not as bad as it seems. Master your panic and take back your life. 21 ways to stop worrying. How to control your anxiety before it controls you. How to make yourself happy. How to stop destroying your relationships. How to stop Everything, what? No, no, this one is not good. Uh, this one, uh, why men marry bitches? Men are from earth, women are from earth. What to do when he has a headache? What? Men are from earth, women are from earth. What? I don't get these books. What to do? The six second shrink. This looks like a good one. Fun as Psychotherapy, hmm. let's get rational game. Hmm. Three minute therapy, change your thinking, change your life. Dating, mating and relating. Unconditionally accepting yourself and others. Resolving your past. Read them all, well, almost all. But I'm afraid I'm still in the before stage. I still have emotions, feelings, confusion, anger. Those after people, they must be so happy, so peaceful, so empty. Okay, okay, breathe deeply, start counting to 10, prepare yourself to relieve your anxiety, to relax, to talk. Okay, here we go. Damn it, this is gonna be difficult. You don't have the references to our complicated Romanian, Dacian, Thracian, Roman, Ottoman, Byzantine, Balkan, communist, post-communist, anti-communist, pro-American, anti-American, American, non-American, non -American, no history. All you know about us is Dracula, the vampire, Ceausescu, the dictator, and Nadia Comaneci, the gymnast. Anyway, Nadia is cool. She never comes into my dreams with her perfectly fit body. So forget about her. She's not in this story. 
I have more important, heavier issues on my mind, stuff like life and death, revolution. No time to worry about my cellulite unless the bullet stops by in it like 20 years ago. And I will end with a monologue of a young woman from Ukraine written initially for a New York project about sex traffic developed with the director Tamila Woodard. Rainbow Nina, a girl dances around a pole. Sometimes it's a strip dance, sometimes it's Swan Lake. They call me Rainbow now, a nice name, a name hiding the bruises inside me. The foundation is taking care of those on the outside, the purple rainbows on my face. I could be a purple swan dancing in a purple swan lake, a new ballet written for me, just for me, the most stupid girl in the world. When Misha invited me to that party back home in Ukraine, I said, no, no, I don't want to go, Misha. Tomorrow I have rehearsal for Swan Lake. It's my big debut on the stage of the opera. I don't want to mess it up. No, I can't go. I stayed at home. Mom made piroshki and I drank a glass of milk like all the Monday's nights before. I slept like a baby and I dreamt of being a white swan dancing until I take off from the floor and I start flying, flying. I'm turning 15 up there in the sky and mom is making a huge birthday cake for me. A birthday cake spinning like an UFO, taking me far, far away, but not here. In this scary stroboscope land, a mad night with flickering plastic stars, I can't wake up, it's not a dream, I'm here. And those sweaty faces are staring at me. I'm here and I'm dancing for them. I'm turning 16 today and there's no birthday cake for me, nothing. Oh yeah, there's something. Cheers to my rainbow of bruises, Nazdarovia. When Misha invited me to that party, I said, no, I don't want to go. I can't go. I have to dance tomorrow, Swan Lake. But there will be an impresario from America there at the party. You could dance in America for money, real money. No, Misha, I can't go. I don't want to go, no. When Misha invited me to that party, I said, no. When Misha invited me to that party, I said, no. When Misha invited me to that party, I said, no way, no. When Misha invited me to that party, I said, I said, oh God, I wanted to say no. When Misha invited me to that party, I said, I said, I said, cool, thanks, yes. Thank you all. Thank you all for still, still being with us. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you. So next up, um, Mariana, Marina Delaney has sent us a video. She's actually on the call, so we can wave to her, uh, but we're gonna start her video now. Hello, my name is Marina Delaney. And tonight I will be reading from my novel, entitled The Thrift Shop Diary. The book is written as a diary in 12 month-long chapters, and I will be reading a few excerpts from chapter one, January Obsession. Thanks so much for listening. January one, dear diary. The night of the car crash, has it been a year and a half already? I received a call at two in the morning. Picked up the phone, assuming it was a wrong number. Heard a voice nearly inhuman on the other end. It was Vic. Ellie, wake up. Mom and Dad were in a huge accident. Daddy's dead. Mama's in the hospital. Hearing those words unannounced from the depth of night felt as if swarms of locusts had been released from the center of my heart. They buzzed through my veins in reckless cross-purpose from the top of my head to the end of my big toe. 
Then my knees gave way and I collapsed to the ground. That single disquieting event is why I'm keeping the diary. You're my New Year's resolution. Except I can't write now on account of the brunch Cal and I are hosting in a few hours. We're crazed. Actually, he's not crazed, only me. I've got cotton head and bed head and it's snowing like mad. Plus the outlet by the toaster blew sparks and I had to move the coffee bar. The 15 minutes I'd set aside for you just got whacked down to three, no matter. I'm in no shape for thankless introspection, can you tell? Besides, we've got the whole year ahead of us, 364 days. Plenty of time to explain what's happened to me, how, where, and why. Yours, Ellie. January 2nd, Dear Diary. Yesterday's party is the first we've had in a while. Got frantic with the electrical issue. It was the breaker. Normally, Cal and I do barbecues in July while Graham and Harriet are away at camp. We have a big flat yard here, much bigger than at our old house on Ramsey Road in Seaport, neighbors spitting distance in every direction. Now we've got this custom ranch down a cul-de-sac called Mim Circle. Very private, too much so. Still miss my old Dutch colonial with the creaky floors. Miss my cherry wood banister too, and the transom window rising like a phoenix above our front door. The upstretched beech tree by the garage and the boy with the lisp who raked our leaves. What was his name again? Trent, Trevor? Trevor, that's right. Anyway, one thing's certain. BBQs in summer are a lot simpler than brunch buffets on New Year's morning, which are a lot easier than formal suppers, what Mama used to love. She and Dad, whether on Long Island or in Paris, especially with the Levesques, Grandmama Therese, and sad cousin Rainy. Those dinners were les bombes, as Vic would say. Who let Jasper out? Think I see his ringtail through the brambles by the trees. He shouldn't be outside when it's this cold. She wigs me out, even long distance. Not Jasper, Vic. Oh no, I'm getting way ahead of myself. I have so much to tell you. No more rambling. Best to approach things in order, methodically. I can do this tomorrow. Yours, Ellie. January 5th, Dear Diary. Let me cut to the chase. I've got more issues than National Geographic. Issue number one, I am no longer the person I was before my parents got killed 16 months ago. The passage of time has been healing, but the grief is entrenched. Like scar tissue, it doesn't leave. The only way I can possibly help you understand is by explaining my mother and father, their life and their death from the beginning. My mother, Sophie McBride, a graduate of the Sorbonne, moved from Paris to New York in the late 1950s as an interpreter to the United Nations. She stopped working there after she married Dad and became pregnant with Victoria. I was born a few years later, and then came our brother, Chris. My father, Dr. Gerald McBride, was a history professor at the College of Long Island in Haddington, New York, a reverse traffic commute from Seaport, where we lived. My parents met at a lecture at Columbia University about France under Nazi occupation. Dad was there because he was writing his doctoral thesis on Nazi-occupied France. Mama was there because she lived there. Dr. McBride took life as it came, though not without a healthy dose of skepticism. He championed civil rights, egalitarianism, Jungian psychology, fair trade, feminism, and democratic rule. He was also an ardent atheist, but despite his lack of faith, my father had a chainless manner in his speech and countenance, which made him loads of fun. He was a free spirit. He also sported a trim goatee, a feature which, conjoined with formidable intelligence, fostered in him an authoritative air. Put another way, Jerry McBride was charismatic and a looker at that. Long Island lived living suited my father because it provided the means for his scholarly endeavors and suited my mother because of its proximity to Manhattan. Mama reveled in the unmatched treasures of the Metropolitan Museum of Art and its neighbor, the Frick. She marveled at how those two museums alone housed eight Vermeers when there were only something like 35 in the whole wide world. Seaport held the added advantage of being only an hour's car ride, car ride from Kennedy Airport. 
I have much more to say about Paris, but I can't get into it just yet. For now, what I'll tell you is this. Considering it was the Rocky Horror 70s, growing up on Long Island had its advantages. Yours, Ellen. January 6, Dear Diary. Issue number two. I have a secret. Don't panic. It's not a deep, dark, dangerous secret. It's actually not that big of a deal. I'm a compulsive thrift shopper. See, that isn't too deep or dark, except it's a total obsession for me. I buy much of my clothes, and it gets worse, I buy much of my kids' clothes in thrift stores. Buy lots of other things secondhand, too. Like I said, this isn't much of a secret, but I still feel super awkward about it, and I'll explain why. I go thrift shopping every week, usually twice a week, sometimes more. Thrifting is a driving force in my life. It's my crack. It makes me tick. That's the real issue. The act is a manifestation of my state of mind, which can't be summed up in a single paragraph. When we moved from Long Island to Wilton, Massachusetts, I found solace by thrifting on the sly. Now I find added solace by writing in you. Yours, Ellen. January 25th, Dear Diary. Not having a good day. Got the nerve knot, and I know why. There's something I've been putting off telling you. It occurred the summer of the accident, maybe three or four weeks prior. Was definitely weird. It started with a call from my mother. That isn't what was weird. We phoned every day. What was different was Mama's uneven voice, as if she'd been crying. Startled by her tone, I asked if everything was all right, and she said yes, it was. I was almost prepared to believe her, were it not for the fact that in the next breath, my mother said she wanted to visit me in Wilton without Dad. My parents always came up together, so this was way out of the norm. I told her she could come any time, certainly, but having planned our vacations already, we set our sights on Labor Day weekend. Then came the car crash, and needless to say, Mama's visit never materialized. My husband, Cal, is the only person besides me, and now you, who know about this, my mother's semi-mysterious call. I told him about it that same day, and we wondered naturally what could be going on, but reason the matter would be disclosed in due time. There was no rush. Truthfully, I'd half forgotten the call until last August, around the first anniversary of their deaths. I was driving when the whole of the conversation came flooding back verbatim, and ever since it dangles before me like a ripened fig waiting to be plucked. My mind scrolls through multiple questions. What could Mama have been so upset about? Why drive to Wilton alone? Did something happen? Was Dad sick? Was she sick? Would it have made a difference had I gone down to see them right away, talked to Mama before going on vacation? Could I have prevented their death had I been more present? Of course, these questions are unanswerable, and I suppose a moot point. But insofar as I'm trying to write down all the things that can't be summed up in a paragraph, this is an important piece of my inner turmoil. The mystery of Mama. Yours, Ellie. January 31st, Dear Diary. So far, I'd say my New Year's resolution, our writing project, is going by the numbers. Except one thing bothering me is I've forgotten a few things in the course of our January together that I'd still like you to know. So I've decided on the last day of every month, I'm going to reflect back and tell you something I left out. Here's this month's forget-me-not. Regarding Mama's mystery phone call, the way I knew my mother had been crying was in uttering my name, her voice halted midway. Elle, she exclaimed, never completing the second syllable. There remains in that open note a vexing potency, a metaphor for the words she wanted to say but never did. I have a pressing desire to fill in the blank. Thank you for your attention, and good night. Thank you, everybody, and thank you for sticking around. Um, I hope to see you tomorrow and Sunday for our other events. And I'm going to put that donation link in the chat one more time.
or you could just go to our website, artspartner.org and find it. So thanks everybody and uh, have a good night.